I have been working with the food system since the food conspiracy and those were the food buying clubs where you just got together to buy food together because the idea was that good food, healthy food, organic food doesn't have to be just for rich people, that we can have good food without being rich. So we got together and took control of the food, not just the price that we didn't have to pay high price, but also trying to get hold of the farmers and trying to also teach ourselves how organic farms worked and what was the difference between organic and commercial and so on. So it was the effort to educate ourselves. It wasn't so much at the time to create jobs. And when the clubs got so big, we decided to open up storefronts. And somewhere along the line, I got involved after volunteering to work with the, one of the stores, uh, first at the heat food store and then at other avenues, which is in the outer sunset. And my folks that I work with, my coworker, kept asking me when I, whenever I tell them anecdotal history, that why don't you put down these thoughts you know, in computer and make a book with this. And I thought that was a great idea, but history was never really my favorite subject, so I kind of put it off for a while. But then I decided that I can actually tell story. That's better. Her story is always better than history. <laughs> And so I decided to do it that way, and I interviewed a lot of people, including one of the gentlemen is here today, Adam, and his photo is also in the book. Adam had been working with the food system almost as long as I have been. So I interviewed maybe 24, 34 people. So a lot of those voices are here. There are a lot of quotes in the book. The book is not just about making the stores happen. It's about the whole moment and how that moment was possible then and how some of those legacy, the remnants, growth, seeds that germinated are still going on in different directions. So that's what the book is about. Uh, in addition to three institutions that are still thriving, including Rainbow, which a lot of you know if you live in the area, <laughs> and other avenues and a, a produce distributor called Veritable Vegetables. So those three people, and they each get a chapter as an example showcasing what's concretely left. But a lot of things that grew out of the moment isn't something that is tangible right now. And a lot of those thoughts and ideas and dialogues are also in this book. So the book is divided into um, Three parts, first the history, general history of the food cooperatives in the Bay Area, and then uh, the people's food system, how it grew and what made it collapse, and then about the three entities that survived and how they survived, whereas the other people disappeared. And a uh, really good portion of the last portion of the book is uh, about the vision, the future vision. How can we build from what's left? and what can we all do in small and big ways, okay? So before I read some things from the, my book, I want to tell you that I have this 10 minutes um, video that's kind of a really special treat because as far as I know, it's the only recorded history of the people's food system, which served thousands and thousands of uh, a household in the 70s and uh, nobody else made any film. A friend of mine made a film with a very old uh, eight millimeter camera. A lot of you probably don't even know what it is. But uh, so if the quality isn't great, the sound is really poor, but you will get a slice of that era because it is 70s for sure. So first I'm going to read a little bit from my book as it is customary, but I don't want to read too much because I want you to buy and read it yourself. Okay. Uh, so how did it all start? Okay, so it was the 70s that the youth of America who had settled here, restless from the 60s, uh, they were not very happy with the now settled war in Vietnam and what the war had created by global capitalism and funded by big industry. 
Many young people dropped out of society that seemed to offer nothing worth emulating. They wanted to replace consumerism, greed, and hawk mentality with a world of sharing and harmony. Energized by leadership for socially aware artists, musicians, activists, ordinary street people, a new decentralized food system spread across the country. Okay, so a lot of these people, it wasn't just about changing food itself, but they wanted to change the whole society. We all did, you know, we tried our best. <laughs> uh, so this, of course, came very um, fast because first, in the 70s, we had a lot of clubs, and then we had about a dozen stores, and then we had about six distributing venues, and all this happened in within like four years, right, Adam? It was really amazing. It just kind of combusted, like one store would have just a little bit of money to open another store in another section of the town. They had a little bit more money, they would help out third people. And we trained each other. We had a lot of fundraisers and dance parties and a lot of dope got smoked, I'm sure. But we had a lot of fun, but it was also really, really hard work as well. So I'm going to now skip a little bit and talk a little bit about the success. This was our high days. And this is something you'll see in the movie. The movie was made, the video was made when it was successful. Not really as many venues open yet, but everybody was very much into the dream of this is going to happen. They were really, really very optimistic. Unlike what happened last night, that <laughs> we are not feeling optimistic today, but at the time, we were really thinking, okay, we can do it. You know, we can really replace the cardboard food with real food. We can actually shut down all the safe ways and make all these little stores connected to each other and people's food system could just go around the globe. Uh, so at the height of the people's food system between 76 and 78, there were approximately two dozen community food store supporting and supporting collective. Although they followed some of the international principle of cooperatives, uh, the people's food system worker remained reluctant to identify their workplaces as co-op because they were, we had experiencing, experienced other co-ops, they were consumer co-ops that had become so big in the 50s that they were just co-ops in the name that they really weren't serving their members at all. So we kind of refrained calling ourselves co-op, we just call ourselves community stores, and the people who worked there called themselves collective members. So those were more of the words that we used. The idea was to make it so that people who work there and the people we serve would be the same, that there wouldn't be that much of a distinction. And a lot of the stores were small, so it was working at the time. So in addition to um, doing a lot of this work and distribution, a lot of the people who work like in the warehouse, like Adam work, actually went to conferences to organize other workplaces. They delivered food far away, even like in different uh, states, all the way to Washington and so on. So there was a lot of back and forth between other uh, people's food system and other food systems that were going on as far as Minneapolis. So this was going on across the nation, and it was a very powerful moment. So let's see, I'm going to skip on the demise off. Maybe it will come up in the Q&A after we watch the movie. Maybe some of you will have some questions. So I'm gonna skip that because I want to really have the time for the movie and question and answer. I want to make this as much as you know, sharing information as possible. So the survivors, the three business, the three businesses that revitalized themselves and are now doing well. How is that that these survived and remained vibrant even today? The continuing strength of the various food and justice movement helped, as did the growing national interest in organic foods and healthy eating. But that is not all that kept these businesses going. While one after the other, all of them folded. For all these three, 
it is clear that their success in business and food activism was and is largely due to, one, a strong connection with both their immediate neighborhood and the food and justice community at large. Two, constant attention to pragmatic business practices, such as knowing you know, how much the cost of goods is and you know, things that we have to learn just like the, any market does. Uh, and three, a clear mission to bring healthy food to the people. Four, a strong commitment to workplace democracy. That, you know, it's not something that we are just selling food, it's also we are serving ourselves as well as a community of workers. Okay. Now I'm going to read a little bit from the vision, keeping the vision. Also, after the vision chapters, there's a really uh, comprehensive uh, appendix with list of markets, like farmer's market, organizations that give out food for free. Uh, there's a map of uh, a small group. irrevocable damage caused by global capitalism. How can we address world hunger, climate change, and economic instability? These are hot topics to discuss among co-op supporters. Some scholars predict that the growth of corporate-based income inequality is inevitable. You know, that's a lot of the French economists said, this is it, you know, all we get is Donald Trump. But then there are other people, and they argue in two books that I study that really gave me hope. One is called Democracy at Work, A Cure for Capitalism by Richard Wolff. And the other book is America Beyond Capitalism by Gar Alparovitz. So these books tell you that this is not the end of it all, that we can organize, that we can make things happen here, that we can make a difference. So then there's a list of things what we all can do and so on. Okay. Thank you. So now we are going to watch the movie, followed by question and answer if you have about the movie or about the book. If the people that were in this film from the 70s are still around today and they have maintained their rent control apartments, their cost of housing is very modest. And I, and, and I wish I was one of them. Right. I, well, I, have, I have kind of an answer, but other people might have answered. I think that a lot of these people, as it shows in my book, uh, were discouraged after the people's food system folded. And there was a whole drama and a lot of reason. And some of them was unfortunately similar to what might happen soon with, you know, Trump economics, you know. Because the economics, all the rents, triple and quadruple, and this was true for storefronts as well as our home rents, you know, because it, it wasn't like we didn't have rent control when people needed to sell a building, you know, they just sold the building and there was no vacancy and there was just no support for small businesses. I can um, list when just... When control begin? In San Francisco, do you know? Uh, uh, way before I came here. Oh, 79? Hey, before I came here, I've been here for a long time. But at any rate, so there was a lot of factor why a lot of these people that are in the film aren't probably around, or if they are around, they probably decided to do something else to stay in the Bay Area, like myself, okay? But some of us who did continue to work, like I have worked with marginal income all my life in one of these stores, we did it more creatively, like holding two jobs or learning how to live marginally. And, you know, it wasn't that easy. 
but some of the stores couldn't survive because their buildings got sold or their rent quadrupled and they just couldn't keep their doors open. I know at least three collectives that were older than 25 year old, three uh, co-ops uh, that folded between 14, just recently, like 2014, 2015, because they got kicked out of their building. Right? So that's the reality is in the Bay Area. You can't do what you used to be able to do in the 70s, what I'm trying to tell you. I'm, I'm seeing empty storefronts all over Castro. Let's take over. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> like the businesses can't afford to come in. There are a lot of MC stores. There's uh, one store that was a real uh, food store. When I came here, this was before people's food system, before food conspiracy. There were like a lot of moms and pops health food stores, and they were really nice store. And then there was a series of little store connected, owned by a private chain called Real Food. One of them, Real Food, is empty for 30 years on Noe Valley, Noe and 24th. Right across from, um, there's a Whole Foods, okay? Right by a store called, a bookstore called Folio. It's Castro and 24th, that's going to be really prime estate, right? Somebody's able to sit on that property for more than 30 years now. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there are a lot of empty spaces in Berkeley and San Francisco. There should be cooperatives, among other things. Any other question, comment? Yes, Janet. You know, um, there's a lot of food and other people. There's a number of food co-ops throughout the country, and they have members. And then if you're a member, you get a 10% discount at the counter. Um, is that something that would help finance food co-ops here? It could. That's a different model, the consumer cooperative model. It could, and I think that even the consumer cooperatives, there are two really good ones, one in Sacramento that just moved into a huge location, and one is in Davis. They were having some sort of a problem with the discount and even patronage refund to customers, so they have replaced that or eliminated that. I don't know the reasoning or the bookkeeping reasoning behind it, but they found it too cumbersome, so they're not doing that anymore. But there are other parts of the country that is still working to promote membership. So Rainbow is now the only co-op in the city of San Francisco? Other avenues. Where is that? It's on 44th and Judah in the outer Sunset District. Oh, why not sort of in the downtown, you know, the... Other avenues is in San Francisco. <laughs> that's, that's way the up. whole city is 14 miles long only. When on a bike, it doesn't... I'm on a bike, so it's a... It's not that long a bike, right? pretty handy. That's fine. Rainbow's a good... They're our sister store. We love Rainbow. Do you remember, Shanta, the original Other Avenues um, storefront? It, what is that now? Do you know what build... What um, that business is right now? Closer to 46, and it's where General Store is now. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. the little Botiki gifty store. Yeah. Anybody else have questions? Um, you alluded the, to this a little bit in the film, but you were showing the paper and the reactions of the town to the food co-op mysteries. What was the... Were other businesses... Um, threatened by the co-ops, or what was Safeway's reaction, or any, any kind of reaction from the regular grocery stores? There were some, there's some of this touching in the how the food system collapsed. There were some conspiracy theory, or maybe real threats, that some people, some um, Safeways, they were threatened by the fact that we were serving thousands and thousands of household, and it was declining their sales, especially if the very effective food conspiracy was in their neighborhood, such as they hate food conspiracy. Like we had a, a mantra that, you know, if you cannot walk to a neighborhood to order your food, you should start your own food conspiracy. So there were that many food conspiracy. But can you add something to that, Adam? Because he, Adam worked at the um, warehouse, cooperating warehouse. Um, the stories around how much um, 
big stores like Lucky and Safeway may have been threatened by growing uh, food system? I'll have to really dig deep in memory to come up with a more concrete answer. But I do recall there being some, well, uh, um, perhaps conspiracy theories that large food supermarket chains um, were aware of our efforts. Could I come up with a document to, you know, nail that down? Not, not at the tip of my tongue. Um, but um, it's a possibility. Yeah, there were other, you know, you will read about some other stories too, that there were perhaps outside forces you know, like uh, undercover agents who were infiltrated in some of our meetings to, d who knows? There was a lot of that. So you've obviously been in this um, cooperative food system for a very long time. Right. Um, is there anything you would have done differently now that you've had, you know, the foresight um, to help make this, um, these alternatives more viable? in this day and age? That, that's a really, really a good question. I actually had one of the people in the audience from Rainbow, and he was rather young, must be in his 20s or so, and he asked something similar, like, how many times did you think, I can't do this anymore? <laughs> and so, but I like the way you said it, like, you know, what we could have done better or different. Yeah, I, I think about that a lot. In fact, I have put some effort, not so much putting myself, but what could have happened that could have saved more of the venues, more of the stores, you know, more of the bakeries or whatever. Yeah, so the book touches upon that. Could you share a couple of those ideas? Myself, I think that, unfortunately, I was, and so were a lot of little stores were, so involved day-to-day -day survival that really took toll on my life that we really didn't have time to think. But now if I really had to reverse the time, I could say that, you know, maybe having a sense of better capitalist, you know, like having better capital instead of just <laughs> raising money in a shoestring like bake sale. I mean, we did really strangest thing to, you know, make a few bucks to get going for the next rent, you know because we were working on volunteer bases and we were really having fun, you know, and we also had other jobs that was our job to pay rent. And my rent was like $60 a month, I kid you not, you know, and it was like a Victorian house that we shared with two other people. So we all paid $60, yeah. You know? So, you know, this was not that far long ago, you know. Uh, so at the time, either we were really struggling, but we were kind of enjoying the struggling. So if I had to reel it back, maybe I shouldn't, we shouldn't have enjoyed. And I'm speaking about myself and the few people that I was involved with, you know, that we could have planned better, you know, with a better capital. And I think this is probably my message now, now that we have better planning, like at other avenues, like we are right now working on five-year plan, you know. We didn't have that vision at the time, you know, and I wish that we, some of us did, that we could have. And some of those who did, you know, like Veritable, Veritable is like either the first or the second largest organic distributor in, in the uh, U.S., which is probably means in the world, you know. So they are really big, so obviously they did something right. What's it called? Veritable Vegetable. Veritable. They're not a store, they are a distributor, they're a wholesaler. And they are also no longer uh, cooperative. They're not collective anymore. Where does, where does uh, Rainbow get their? They get a lot of their produce from Veritable, but we also do, and they have other sources that they get produce from. We try to get as much local as possible. Okay. So I just wanted to clarify, Shanta, from the, the film, the short film. So yeah. it seemed like um, a group would go out to a warehouse and collect the food, and then they would distribute it. Would they, br they would bring it to storefronts, but also to individuals' homes, is that right, or garages where they could No, be I think that the film was 40 minutes long, 
So it was spliced and you know shortened. So there's a little bit confusion because some of the scene was actually like when they were really carrying big bags and stuff. They were actually making delivery from the carpeting warehouse to the store, not to the food conspiracy. But when the food conspiracy was just the buying club, we would just go to the farmer's market once a week. So you won't get fresh food every day, just on Saturday. We order on Wednesday, we get the food on Saturday. And then the dry good, which we call the Great Divide, where we had a lot of uh, uh, flour and oil and so on, that we did in bigger trucks and at bigger places, and the cooperating warehouse was born before a lot of the storefronts were born. So we got it from them, as well as from some of the cheese factories, as well as from you know, a lot of the wholesale sources that we developed. And one of the laws when the warehouse closed, which is, you know, and you will read in the demise, you know, that was kind of dramatic, is that we lost our source, you know. And to answer your question again, one of the things I would like to have happen, even with the two co-ops left, is if we can develop a warehouse again. Because you know that's what's missing. You know we are now relying on some corporate warehouse, and they are not always serving us right. And also, you know, it's not same as a mere cooperative warehouse. Um, related, I wanted to ask: Do you currently uh, work with um, Rainbow to um, have meetings or talk about like successes or? That, that would be another really good good thing for us to do. Not, not regularly, you know, like I might go and talk with their promotional person, like let's do this and that, you know. The promotional person from Rainbow. Uh, so only occasionally, I wish we had more regular um, chat to have more camaraderie as well as maybe even financial success, you know, exchange to make it more successful. What exactly is the process of starting a co-op? Like, are there any uh, things that you have to do differently than like starting a traditional? Uh, yes, there is a, this is not a how-to book. However, it has um, resources and we in the Bay Area are still very fortunate that three institution organizations are here. Two of them are Oakland, uh, one of them is Davis. So the Davis um, institution is called uh, CCCD, it stands for California Center for Cooperative Development. And one in, San, in Oakland is called NOBAS, it's a network of uh, Bay Area worker cooperatives. And then the other is actually serving the whole country's worker cooperative, and that's called USFWC. So it's a US Federation of Worker Cooperatives. And they can answer your concrete question. But as far as I know, all you need is three people, perhaps a lawyer, and a good bylaw, a storefront, if it is you know, a retail, but if you're, you know, doing something else in your basement, like a music co-op, you don't even need a storefront. But they can, they can actually give you, and there are funds around if you seek for funds, you know, depends. Uh, two of the places, two of the um, organizations that can get funding more easily than others if you are trying to get something done in unserved community or if you're doing something in rural community, especially when it comes to food. Okay, any more questions? Uh, um, did you have any um, guidelines concerning um, how you would accept uh, organic produce um, it's like, you know, you know, uh, for example, you know, certain organizations, you know, like USDA, you know, it's like, you know, they have guidelines that the farmer has to meet, you know, do certain things right. specifically to be able to, you know, get that approval. Right. 
When we started, actually, there were not that many guidelines, so we relied on farmers' information. We relied on farmers' honesty. Often we would go to visit their farms because they will just open our door. They were very, very friendly with us. And a lot of what you see right now, that California developed the standard, organic standard, actually came from cooperatives. There were people who worked in the co-op who said, we can't call everything organic, so let's develop standards. So there were a few people who organized, and there were a few uh, cooperatives that became backbone, what later became California certified. And now the US certification is actually a little bit, or I should say a lot, diluted from the California certification. So California certification is still a lot more stringent and more uh, rules than is the US. What defines organic? Uh, well, if the loose uh, dictionary definition is something you grow, that you don't use chemicals in fertilizer, or you don't spray to get rid of the bugs. But then there's a lot of uh, details involved in there, too. Like last time, the government wanted, you know, to have genetically modified and still call it organic. And we said, no, we can't do that. And we actually want that. But then we raised another uh, concern about labeling of GM. We lost that battle. Remember that? So it's uh, Trader Joe's, Safeway, and Rainbow. They all use the same organic standard? Uh, they're supposed, if a product says organic, it should be organic. The difference between, though, if you get something from Trader Joe, apart from it being usually in plastic, is that they sell organic and commercial side by side. So for one, they're not really wedded to the organic principle. But secondly, they're also mixing the commercial and organic you know, containers side by side. But they're segregated. Somewhat. Okay, but thank you so much. This was a great crowd. And I don't know about you, but I really feel uplifted after being so depressed last night. <laughs> so, thank you for coming. Really, really appreciate the crowd.